Hey there, in this video we are going to look at how you can sometimes use trig identities in the process of solving some trig equations. So using trig identities in the process of solving trig equations, I've got a couple of examples here, the first of which is this one, and you'd suspect that trig identities would be helpful because I've put it in this video, but if you didn't know that, something you can notice that would help you recognize that is that it involves two different trig functions and when you have two different trig functions you can use identities to make a replacement for one of them so that you only have one trig function and then you can go about solving it now sometimes when you have two different trig functions you can work with it and still manage to solve it algebraically but in this case, we're not going to be able to do it unless we use a trig identity. And the one that we're going to use is the one that relates cosine and secant. And specifically, we're going to replace this secant here with what we know it's equivalent to, which is 1 over cosine of x. Everything else we're going to leave the same. So we're going to have 3 cos x minus 2 times that minus 1 equals 0. Or maybe what would look a little simpler is if we wrote 3 cos x minus 2 over cos x minus 1 equals 0. And now we've achieved our first goal, which is taking something that involves two different trig functions and creating a new equation that has just a single trig function in it. All right? Now before we go further, let's recognize here this 2 secant x, a common mistake that people make is they change 2 secant x not to 2 over cos x, but you often see that someone changes that to 1 over 2 cos x. The 2 doesn't end up on the bottom there. It's just the secant that ends up on the bottom. So make sure you don't make that mistake while you're working with this. So we have our equation that involves just cosine. How can we go about solving that? Well, if we have an equation where there's uh, the variable in the denominator like that in one of the terms the simplest thing to do is clear out the fraction right away and the way we can do that is to multiply both sides by cosine of x so if we multiply both sides by cosine of x this times this this times this this times this the reason that's going to work is to help it make it simpler is cos x times 2 over cos x that term if we have divided by cos x times cos x it's just going to be 2, right? 2 times cos x divided by cos x is just a 2. But we have cos x times 3 cos x, which is going to be 3 cos squared x. And then we have cos x times this, which is going to be minus 1 cos x. The other side, 0 times cos x is just 0. Now, that looks like something like equations you've seen before, but it's not necessarily terms in the right order for what you've seen before. So if you want it in descending powers of cos x, we're going to write it like that. We're going to write this term next, minus cos x, and we're going to write this term over here, minus 2. Now, to proceed from there, it's uh, worth trying to factor it, because this is a trinomial that can be factored, and it can be factored like this as two binomials here, one that starts with 3 cos x and one that starts with cos x. And if you think about it here, it's got to be minus 2 that these multiply to. So if I just put my numbers in here, say like that and that, and think about, you know, that's 2 cos x, that's 3 cos x, I need it to be minus 1 cos x. And so if I'm putting the signs in there so that they're different, this is the one that I'm going to make minus, this is the one that I'm going to make plus, because we've got minus 3 cos x plus 2 cos x gives me the right middle term there. So if we're proceeding from there, why that helps is now we can split it into two separate smaller equations, right? If you have this whole thing equal to 0, either this is 0 or this is 0. So you just write that down below here. You write either 3 cos x plus 2 equals 0 or cos x minus 1 equals 0. And you can solve each of those two smaller equations separately. This one ends up being 3 cos x equals negative 2, or in other words, cos x equals negative 2 over 3.
And the other one here just ends up being cos x equals 1. So in those two cases there, we're going to look for angles that are going to be solutions to each of those. And for this one, this is not any kind of exact value. So we're going to have to resort to using the calculator here and find the reference angle first. For the reference angle, we're going to go cos inverse of 2 thirds and go to the calculator for that. So then if we find cos inverse of 2 thirds, that's our reference angle. I am actually going to store that as x on here, so I don't have to keep typing it in. Now, I'm going to find my other two angles here from that. The two angles I want to find, because remember that the domain, if you look back here, the domain is x is between 0 and 2 pi. So we're looking within one revolution there. So if we're looking for our solutions, we're going to have one cosine's a negative number there. So we have cosine's negative in quadrant 2 and 3. So that's going to be x1 and that's going to be x2. So x1 is going to be halfway around minus the reference angle. So we've got pi minus x reference and x2 is going to be pi plus the reference angle, which we can go back to the calculator to do. So we can then say our first angle is going to be pi minus that reference angle. X on here is where I stored it. And then we can find the other one as well. X plus, sorry, pi plus that reference angle, which is that. So we have, if we're going to two decimal places here, which is probably good enough, 2.30 and 3.98. So we have 2.30 roughly and roughly 3.98. Now the other one, cos x is 1, actually we don't need to resort to the calculator for that because we can just use the fact that this is an exact value we know either from thinking about the graph or from the unit circle. I tend to like to think about the graph of cosine. Cosine starts at 1, it goes down to negative 1 at pi and back up to 1 at 2 pi. So it's 1 at 0 and at 2 pi. The thing is though, if you look carefully at this, it says less than 2 pi, so the only value we're going to include there is, is, uh, is 0. So our solution to this is x equals 0. So if we're going to put a list of solutions all together here, we're going to say that x is equal to 0, 2.30, 3.98. I should probably instead write roughly equal to, because two of those are approximate. All right, so those are the solutions to that equation. All right, one more we're going to try here. There's another equation. So this equation says sine of 2x plus cos x is equal to 0. And we're going to solve it with that same domain for x. Now, when you see sine of 2x and cosine of x, there's a couple things happening there. There's two different trig functions involved, but there's also two different expressions inside of those trig functions. One of them is a double angle. So that's going to be another reason why we're going to have to do something with identities here. And the thing that we're going to do is we're going to replace that sine of 2x with what we know it's equivalent to. Sine of 2x is equal to 2 sine x cos x. And then I'm going to keep this part the same, plus cos x. Now you might say, yeah, but you didn't really achieve what you wanted to achieve because you still have two different trig functions in there. You have sine and cosine. But sometimes, even though you have two different trig functions, you can separate them in the process of factoring. And what I mean by that is in this case, cosine is a common factor here. So we can factor out the cosine. So we can write this as cos x times two sine x plus one. If you factor out that cosine, now we can separate it into two smaller equations because we have this times this is equal to zero. So that means we can say either this equals zero, either cos x equals zero, or this equals zero. Two sine x plus one equals zero. And so if we follow that down on the, the one on the right here, two sine x equals negative one, or in other words, sine x equals negative one half. Now, both of these things we're gonna be able to solve without a calculator, 
because those are both exact values. The first one here, zero, is another one where I would just think about the graph of cosine again. Cosine starts at one, hits zero at pi over two, hits negative one at pi, hits zero again at three pi over two, and hits that at two pi. So the two values we're looking for are these two right here, that one and that one, which are pi over two and three pi over two. That's what x is from this equation, this part of this side. And the other side here, that is a value that you know from a special triangle, hopefully, that value of one half. Now, first of all, we should realize where we're looking. Sine is a negative number there. So we're looking in quadrants three and four is where sine is negative. So that's going to be one of the angles, and that's going to be the other angle. So we first of all need to think about what the reference angle is. Again, the fact that this is one half here, we can get it from a special triangle. Our special triangle is going to be this one, where we have one, a two on the hypotenuse, and root three here. And that angle in there, the smaller angle in that triangle, is pi over six. So the reference angle is pi over six. But we are, of course, here looking in quadrant three and four. So we are going to have pi plus the reference angle and two pi minus the reference angle. And so our two angles here are gonna be pi plus the reference angle. We've got halfway around is pi, or in other words, if we're talking about sixths, it's six pi over six plus another one is seven pi over six. So one of our angles is gonna be seven pi over six. Or if we go into quadrant four here, if we go all the way around, two pi is like 12 pi over six. And if we back up one, we were at 12 pi over six, and one back is gonna be 11 pi over six. So we have four solutions here that we can put all together at the end, right? We have those two from that side and those two from that side. Our four solutions are, we can put at the bottom here. I won't circle those, that's not the final answer here. We have pi over two, if you want them in order of smallest to biggest, it's going to be that one first, then that one, if that's important to you. I guess it makes some sense to do that. And then 3 pi over 2 is the next one, and the biggest one is 11 pi over 6. Those are our four solutions for that equation. All right? So maybe before we're done here, I just point out, this was just two examples of how you can use trig identities in the process of solving equations. We had one that involved the double angle identity for sine, and we had one that involved the reciprocal identity for secant, but there could obviously be lots of different equations that all involve different trig identities, so you're gonna have to practice this. You're not gonna think that you have it nailed down after just watching me do two of these, so do some practice, all right? So that's using trig identities in the process of solving equations. And the important thing to recognize is when you look at an equation, think of an identity that's gonna allow you to simplify things and either cut down on the number of trig functions involved or create an equation that only has a single trig function and then you can use the other equation solving skills that you have. All right, that's it. Mm -hmm.